أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأصلي وأسلم على رسولك الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فنسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يجعل ما نقوله ونسمعه حجة لنا لا علينا يوم الدين كما نسأله أن يجعلنا من العاملين بالعلم والمتخلقين بالحلم إنه سبحانه ولي ذلك والقادر عليه ثم أما بعد فسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته With the will of Allah Jalla wa ala subhanahu wa ta'ala we have arrived at a point where we are going to look at what the Imam has written about the creed and he meaning the way that you have to believe in Allah Jalla wa ala subhanahu wa ta'ala and the way that you have to believe in the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam and even though this might seem very simple but it is really one of the things that the people today debate about all the time what is the correct way to believe in Allah? What is the correct way to believe in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And this is what we will investigate and we will see that there is so much more than just Imanun billahi wa Imanun bir rasul We will see that there is a thing such as Imanun, imanun lillahi wa Imanun lir rasul And that there is Imanun khafiyun munkatim And that there is Imanun jaliyun zahir and how all of that works. Now, today the, the knowledge of Aqeedah seems to be like oversimplified. Um, exactly like when you study Fiqh, for example, which is jurisprudence. Aqeedah also is a very difficult science. Believing in Allah, just believing in Allah is very easy. You believe in Allah, that's a basic faith. But the problem is that from the very start when the Muslims believed in Allah Jalla wa'ala and the Prophet Sallallahu died, there were so many sects that were speaking about faith that many people no longer know what the faith is that the majority of ulama were upon. What is that? What does it look like? Um, I, I hear so many different things about the names of Allah, the sifat of Allah. What is the correct belief? What is the wrong one? And so many other things. Like somebody asked me last time, the Asha'ira, are they Ahl Sunnah? Are they not Ahl Sunnah? All these things, bi idnillah, we are going to discuss bi idnillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we start as always when we speak about the Shahadatain. We always speak about the reason why the Shahadatain are so important. And if we're going to look back, then you see that the Shahadatain are mentioned in the Arkanul Islam exactly as they are mentioned in the Arkanul Iman. Do we agree? Yani the pillars of Islam, what is the first one? Shadu an la ilaha illallah wa shadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And then when I look at the Arkanul Iman, I meant to be lahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusuli. So the, the Shahadatain are in Arkanul Iman as they are in Arkanul Islam. Do you agree? So then you see that there is a reason for this. The reason why they are present in Islam is because your niya has to be lillah and your ibadah has to be in the light of Sunnati Rasulillah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When we say Sunnah to Rasulillah, it doesn't mean that you go through a Sunnah book and you're going to try to make your own deen. Now our scholars have done that, thank you so much. Now, so it means that we understand the Quran and the Sunnah in the light of how the scholars of Islam have conveyed the message. Then we have it also in Arkanul Iman because if your belief in Allah is not correct, and if your belief in the Prophet Muhammad is not correct, then you have a problem with the core of your belief. And when you have a problem with the core of your belief, either it kicks you out of, outside of the realm of Islam, or it keeps you within the realm, but you are at the edge of a very dangerous valley looking down on hell. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ said when he said that my ummah will be divided into 73 sects, all of them for hellfire, apart from one. And he said, and they are the ones who are upon what I am upon and what my companions are upon. Now, the problem is, as time went on, the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, everything was straightforward. They weren't asking strange questions or difficult questions or complicated questions about the names of Allah, the sifat of Allah, the characteristics of Allah. All was very straightforward. But then we have these people, especially during the, the era of the Abbasiyin. You should know the Abbasiyin. Now, they were very good for scholars. They gave them a lot of money. But on the other hand, they were ruled by the Persians. So there was a bit of that Persian philosophy about God and about almost embodying God Almighty crept into what 
into the Ummah on the one hand and via the Mu'tazila they were fleeing away from confirming the names and the Sifat or the Sifat from Allah So it was a very complicated thing. So all of a sudden now the ulama say, wow, what's going on here? Of course they didn't say wow, right? So they say, what's going on? We really have to refute this. So ilm al-aqidah, the ilm of aqidah is actually a science that teaches you how to refute a wrong belief in Allah Jalla wa'ala. That is what aqidah is about. It's much more than just reading Surah Thalatha or I don't know what. That is not the knowledge of aqidah. It's a book that contains certain things, but that is not the science of aqidah. The science of aqidah, there are like hundreds of books, literally, that have been written by the scholars. So with the will of Allah Jalla wa'ala subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are going to see what Imam Ghazali here has said about it. What we need to know, and that, that's very important, is when I say Imam Ghazali, a lot of people are afraid. So, oh, Imam Ghazali, I, I hope you are not afraid of that name. Don't run away, it's okay. You know, Imam Ghazali, do you know that when he was 36 years old, that he was the chief of all, he was the headmaster of all the scholars in the Islamic, uh, uh, yani, what? How do you say it? Khilafa, in the, when we say Khilafa, I don't mean the ISIS Baghdadi one, right? So he was the, the scholar of the Khilafat al Islamiyah fi Madrasat al Nidamiyah. Yani 250 scholars were his students. He was a faqih before, before being somebody talking about the Ruh. His own Shaykh, Imam al Haramain. Yani, uh, Imam al Haramain al Juwaini, right? They, they, we all read his book. He, he wrote a book in, in Usul al Fiqh that's called yani, Al Waraqat. He said, "Dafantani wa ana hai." Yani, he said, "You buried me while I am still alive." Meaning, I am your scholar in fiqh, but now that you wrote this book, there is no need for me anymore. Meaning that he had attained the pinnacle of knowledge when he was 36 years old. And then he went on and went on, and it's only after that that he said, "I don't want this this position anymore." There was only one position above him that was being the Khalifa. And he said, I don't want this position anymore. The people said, are you, are, are you out of your mind? You are the teacher of teachers of, of the Islamic Khilafah. What do you want more? He said, it doesn't feel right here. It doesn't feel right. And then he was no longer able, as he described himself, to speak. It was like there was a knot in his tongue. And every time he wanted to speak about the deen, he said, this is not right. And then eventually he made a decision to leave that position. And he left. And that is where he started writing about the soul for years and years and years. After what? After having become a, after he became the bigger, one of the biggest Shafi'i scholars, Nam in Usuliyin, and people of philosophy that would refute the philosophy of the Romans, the Greeks, or whatever it may be. And he was there. So people forget this. Oh, that, that lost man that was lost somewhere in the desert. You, you, you didn't even read his biography. <laughs> Do you understand what I mean? So this is why Barakallahu Fikum. When we are going to have a look, of course, in his book, Ihiyal al there are certain things that can be refuted by the scholars. Yes, like Imam Malik said, whenever he would teach, he would say, He said, there is nobody among us, or some of his words are accepted and some are refuted. Apart from whom? From the man that is buried here. Meaning, the Prophet Muhammad, alayhi as-salatu wasalam. So we are going to look at what he is saying bi-idhnillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is going to talk about Iman. For the people that uh, have, don't have the documents that I have done, how do we do that with the people in the mosque? Because I, I actually, now I have prepared the class entirely so that you could follow and read. So maybe for next week, after when the class is finished, you, you take his number and he will WhatsApp it to you. So every time you come to class, and not everything that I write is what I will read. But what I write is what you have to know. Do you understand the difference? So, and, and we have like four A4 pages here where I've translated the text as well and where you will find any, so many different things. So let's get started about Iman. Now, Iman is, is, a, is a topic that was a very strange one at the very beginning of Islam. When we say Iman, it's just like, I believe in Allah, good for you. It's, that's correct. But the definition of Iman is one of the most important ones. To know whether you're a Muslim or not. Why is that important? Based on you being a Muslim, there are certain rules that are connected to marriage, that are con connected, to, connected to inheritance, and so many more things. You will see that the class today is a bit more 
mechanical, a bit more theoretical, but sometimes we need to go through these things, right? It's not always a lovey-dovey flower power kind of talk. Sometimes we need to, to grow into something else. So now Iman at the very beginning was very clear. But then the Khawarij and the Murji'ah, they made everything difficult. The Khawarij are the ones of whom the Prophet said, they are the kilab, the, 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 what, the dogs, no? the hellhounds of hell. Yani they are the dogs of hell. Yani who are they? They were the people that would declare Muslims kafir because of a sin they commit. So the Khawarij, they started, they came into existence in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, but he was able to stop them from rising. So there was Dhul Khuwaisira, like Imam Al-Ajuri rahmatullahi alayhi mentioned in his book Sharia, and he came to the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, i'dil fa innaka lam ta'dil. He said, be just and correct. The Prophet was uh, yani dividing the spoils of war. And he came to the Prophet and said, be just because you are not just. Imagine. Imagine somebody saying this to the Prophet and then he went with his face in his hands and he said, Rahimallahu Musa, laqad udiya udiya bi akthara min thalika fasabat. May Allah yani, be merciful with Musa. He was tested with more than this, but nevertheless, he remained steadfast and patient and endurant. So, and then he said, does Allah entrust me the amana from the skies and I would then deceive him in the amana of the earth? And then the Prophet ﷺ said, from this man, evil will come. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he told the people to take that man's life. And they went and they saw him praying. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, anaqtulu huwa huwa yusalli. Ya Rasulullah, will we take his life while he prays? He said, go. The second one went. The, the, yani the khulafa. Yani they went. And they were not khalifa back then. Yani, so they went. And then eventually he disappeared. And the Prophet said, if he would have been stopped, evil would not have risen yani in my own mind. So these people, they were rebels. And they are the ones that rebelled against Uthman. Anhu, and they were the ones that killed Uthman. Because they said that Uthman, yani the what? The son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu twice. They said that he was not just. He was not just, so they killed him. They killed him while reciting the Quran. They killed him while his wife, Nam, stood in front of him with her hair. And she asked him, do you want me to hide you behind my hair? Because when they see hair, because they were very pious between brackets. They said, if they see my hair, they will not come near to you. He said, it is more preferred to me to be cut into thousand pieces than they seeing your hair. That was his answer. Ghiratul rijal. Ghiratul rijal. So now, if you're going to look, they came in anyway and they stabbed him while he was reading the Mus'haf. And the first drip of his blood, Nam, fell on, Allah will take them Nam, into account on your behalf. And he will take care of them, of these wrongdoers. And that was the drip of blood that fell on it. They stabbed him and stabbed him, stabbed his wife and so forth. They were the Khawarij. These are the same people like Imam ibn al-Jawzi mentioned in Talbis Iblis that Abdullah ibn Abbas went and visited them because he wanted them to, to follow Ali radiallahu anhu. And they, they didn't want to follow. They said Ali is a kafir. Yani the most extreme amongst, among them said Ali is a kafir. Why kafir? Because they said that he didn't rule 100% by the, by the law of Allah jalla So anyway, so now Abdullah ibn Abbas, like in jobs he mentioned in Talbis Iblis, he gets into the camp of the what? Yani of, the, of, of these khawarij. Now you need to know that Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, the Prophet made a big dua for him. So Abdullah ibn Abbas was a big deal. He was of the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was sahib al-Qur'an. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu would, would push him forward whenever there was something that was not understood in relation to the Qur'an. So he was the, the man, eh? the man. So he, he said, and when I entered into their camp, I, it was strange. They, they, said, they just said, hi. They, they didn't give salam. They, hi. Yani, hi in their way. And then he said, I looked at them. And their foreheads nam, were, were so dark of the ongoing prayer. And it was like really rough. It's not wrong to have a 
uh, yani place of sujood like mashallah you have and many other people have so it's not bad right although that the malikiya now i'm like in the sharh of al-muqaddim al-izziya lil jama'at al-azhariya imam ghazali rahimahullah mentioned it as well in the jafi that it is preferred for people to pray on a um, soft uh, underground now a soft floor uh, why because that will stop this from happening uh, he said because that could lead to riya we don't say it does right if you don't do it on purpose who cares but he says it's better so that is what they they would say better on the soft underground and you try to to make it. so anyway he said it was so big he said it was like when you have on your fingers when you work a lot you get it uh, colors okay he said they have it yani, as the camels have it on their knees you you know you, you should look at camel knees he said that was on their foreheads of ongoing prayer he said their eyes were hollow meaning that they it looked like they didn't sleep a lot or eat a lot and they were completely pale because of the qiyam and the siyam because praying at night and fasting during the day their clothes had no color they, they became colorless because they only had one garment and they would wash it all the time. And they are the people that killed Ali radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told Abu Bakr, if, anhu, if you were to compare your prayers to this, you would belittle your prayers. If you would compare your siyam, your fasting to this, you would belittle your fasting. And if you would compare, yani, and they read the Quran, but it doesn't pass their throats, meaning it doesn't go to their hearts. But nevertheless, our ulama of hadith have accepted the khawarij in the Senate. Huh. The khawarij, they are in the chain of transmission of hadith. And the reason why, they would prefer to die than to lie. Look, look at the... <laughs> the it's, it's ajib. No? So it's a contradiction, isn't it? They would prefer to be cut into pieces, literally, than to lie about the Prophet ﷺ. So in the Senate, there is no problem as long as the narration is not connected to their bid'ah. Now, because then we, we don't accept it. So anyway, so these, these are the people that did this. And, and while they were yani, walking away with the companion, now on a stick, ready to roast him, one of them yani, took an apple and he wanted to bite from it. He said, the other one said, do you want to go to hell? So why? He said, are you eating something and it's not even yours? Maybe it's somebody's and it's not like just a free thing. And then the man said, Alhamdulillahi Praise be due to Allah who saved me from hell thanks to you while they were carrying, carrying the Sahabi. Said Ali radiallahu anhu. Yani they kill the people of La ilaha illallah and they keep alive those who do not believe, which is a good thing by the way. And, and that's why you see that when, when you look at what happened in Iraq, the majority of people that got killed were Muslims. The majority of people that are killed in the world by extremist Muslims are Muslims. So we Muslims, we should be even more between brackets afraid than anybody else. Because we are the bullseye for the extremists. Because we live among the kuffar. And we love their law and this and that. So our blood is halal for them. So now to come back. These are khawarij. So ISIS were khawarij as well. They are, not they were. They're, they still are. So khawarij. So the khawarij, they said, and this is where they differ from Ahl Sunnah. We still, we still speak about Iman. They said, Al-amalu huwa al-Iman. They said, deeds is the core of Iman. Meaning, that if a deed disappears, kufr appears. So if somebody doesn't do what is obligatory, you're kafir. If you do what is haram, you're kafir. And then among them, they do takfir as well. Because you have those who say only the one who commits major sins is a kafir. The one who commits minor sins is not a kafir, but he's a fasid. And then they differ. Those who say the one who commits minor sins is a fasid, they say he's a believer in dunya, but a kafir in akhirah. Like the Mu'tazila. And others say, no, he's a believer in this life and a believer in the hereafter. So and, and they are divided among, <laughs> into so many categories and they all kill each other. So, very interesting. 
And this is what was happening. Like we're not even 50 years away from the Prophet and, and we have taken all of these things with us. Kufr, Iman, Bid'ah, how to believe in Allah, how to believe in the Prophet All these things, the Sahaba, the fight between the Sahaba, everything has been transmitted to us and today it has been poured over our heads by the internet and we don't know how to order the information and how to digest all of that information. And we think that we are smart enough to do that. Only scholars are smart enough to do that. And it's not a monopoly. Everybody can become a scholar. Everybody can. The door is open. But exactly like you don't start talking about aer aerodynamics or, or biology or whatever it is, if you have not studied, in the same way don't, we don't talk about the deen if we didn't study. It's a hype. Everybody wants to talk. Everybody wants to share. But where did you study? With whom did you sit? Which book did you study from cover to cover? Maybe the hadith you are sharing goes against the sunnah. A hadith that you shared can go against the sunnah. How does it even work? Well, because one hadith cannot be understood on its own. One hadith about a certain topic is in need of all the ayat and all the hadith and the words of the sahaba and the ijma' about that same topic in order to be understood. So people that take away an understanding from one hadith may go against the sunnah without knowing it. That's why we, when, when scholars say you, you're ready to speak, you speak. When you have your ijazat, your permission, you speak. You have your asanid, you speak. You have your credentials, whatever, from universities and support, you speak. If not, you are not obliged to speak. I know it's nice and fun to speak about the deen, but if all, imagine only the scholars would speak. Only people who've studied. You know, when I say scholars, I mean people that study for 30, 40 years. For me, a talib al-ilm, student of knowledge, 20 years? Wallahi, I'm not exaggerating. Student of knowledge, between 15 and 20 years. Then, then you're grounded. You're, I mean, you're strong. Real scholars, maybe 40 years of study, without exaggerating. And today? So let's go back, the khawarij. So that, that was problematic. So they say, if you commit a sin, you're a kafir. And if you're a kafir, then I can kill you. Please don't copy and paste just this part. <laughs> Belgian imam in Kingston calls to... So they say, that's why sometimes I add extra words when I say things. So they say, which is not the case, and we should, which we should be saying, they are kufar, so we have to, what they say, kill them. <laughs> so, so sometimes I do this because people are very quick to, to cut and paste, copy and paste. Anyway, so now to come back, that were the khawarij. Then we had the murji'a. The murji'a were the opposite. Say, chill, man. As long as you say you're mu'min, you're okay. Just mu'min. <laughs> you, you, you say mu'min, you're fine. I, I, I never saw anybody saying this but a shaitan. And Allah said, Shaitan al insi wal jinn, right? Allah speaks of the shayateen al insi wal jinn. So they say, as long as you are a man, why worry? No. So we say, you have a problem. So some of the murji'ah say, Iman is fine, you don't need to utter faith. And some of the murji'ah say, Iman, Iman is fine, you don't need to perform any deeds. As long as you believe here, no deeds, no uttering of the shahada. And if you utter Iman, and you don't have deeds, you're a mu'min. We say in the light of what you are saying, Shaitan was a mu'min. Because Shaitan said, I swear by your power, I will let all of them go astray. And Shaitan says, Inni Allah. He says, I fear Allah. Allah says, like the Shaitan when he tells the believers, now become a disbeliever and when you do that he says I have nothing to do with you I fear Allah the Lord of the worlds he even says I fear Allah but the iman is not here is it that's not the iman that Allah is looking for as we will see because there is iman lillahi wa billahi so now in the light of what you're saying you're mu'min and now Fir'aun Allah speaks about Fir'aun and he says stay qanatha anfusum zulman wa uluwa their hearts were filled with 
the knowledge that what Musa was saying was true, but they did not want to submit. They said, they had yaqeen. But Allah says they refused. Zulman wa uluwa, because they wanted to oppress and they wanted to lead. Yani leaders that like to oppress usually refute the haq because the haq is never in the advantage of a tyrant. So that didn't help either. That were the murjia. They were fitting. Until today we have that relief in Turkey. Now in certain parts of Syria we have that as well. And, and these, these people, they really believe I can drink alcohol, I can do zina as long as I have la ilaha illallah, I'm fine. So the problem is now, does that make somebody a kafir? Well, there are two things that you, there is a thing you need to know and that's the following. If you commit haram, major sins, not because you deem them to be legit, then you're not a kafir. If you commit sins and you say they're halal, that takes you out of Islam. If it are straightforward, clear, 24 carats, clear cut, halal and harams. But if it's not, it's a shubha or the, the scholars differ about it, that's something else. Even somebody who prays and says prayer is not obligatory, five prayers are not obligatory, leaves the deen by saying this. None? Because it is about your belief, even and about your actions. So Ahl Sunnah says, look, we're not saying that deeds are the essence and the core of faith. Because if that were the case, then somebody who says La ilaha illallah and then dies was never Muslim. And that goes against the hadith of that man during the battle he was fighting the Muslims. And then yani he became a Muslim while fighting. How? I don't know. Don't ask me. Or ask me. <laughs> You know, the, the Sahaba, عنهم, they had a, an immense self-control. You know, it's not like when you look at these series or don't about the Vikings, where they just enter into cities and kill everybody and everything. And they, they, they roar like animals and bears. Like the Sahaba were, I'm not saying that they were fighting like, hi, how are you? And of course not. But they were like literally well-behaved. And they were in control of themselves. They mastered themselves. Like in the story that's known with Ali radiallahu anhu, who was about to stab, had a stab of death, that person, and that he spat in the face of Ali radiallahu anhu, and he said, go. And he said, why? He said, if I were to kill you now, it would be for my nafs. And this is what turned that man a Muslim. When the Romans were fighting the Muslims, and some of the spies looked at them, they said, we can't, we can't win against these people. We can't win against these people. They said, why? He said, we were looking at them from afar and somebody dropped something, a vessel in, 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 in a lake. And all of, his, his, all of the soldiers just dove into the lake to be the first one to get that vessel and give it back to their brother. He said, when they are fighting, they push the others behind them so that they are the shield for the people while we are pushing others forward. That's why sometimes the Romans, they had to attach the feet of their soldiers together so that they wouldn't run away. So that was Sahaba radiallahu anhu. The Prophet Sallallahu even stood up for somebody during the war when a Sahabi had killed a non-Muslim that was fighting the Muslims. And, and the moment that he was about to strike him, he said, La ilaha illallah, and the, 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 the companion nevertheless killed him. And I'm saying that he killed him because, you know, the, 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 the other one had already stabbed the Sahabi radiallahu anhu and they were in a fight and the moment he wants to kill him, he says, La ilaha illallah. So they went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And then he said, Aqataltahu ba'da an qalaha? Did you kill him after? Did you take his life after he said, La ilaha illallah? He said, Ya Rasulullah, he only said it for his life to be spared. He said, Ashaqaqta an qalbihi? Did you open his heart and did you look at it? What will you do with his La ilaha illallah on the day of judgment? So they were even during the battle, the Prophet would, would say, do not kill a woman, do not kill a man, do not kill a priest, do not kill a rabbi, do not kill a farmer working on his land. Only those who raise the sword against you are the ones that you will fight. So they, they said we were afraid. When we would enter into a town, we were just afraid because they have to be sure. Like first, do you have a sword in your hand? That is the way they would do because lives are sacred. And the Prophet ﷺ said, if somebody has a captive 
Nam, he was he was angry because after a fight they put the captives in uh, the, the yani we said captives of war, right? Nam in, in, in the sun and they didn't give them to drink. And then he passed the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. He said, who put them in the sun? Take them out of the sun and give them to eat from what you eat and to drink from what you drink. They are khalqullah, they are the creation of Allah. And now when you look at these people, ISIS, ISIS. First, who are you fighting? Why are you fighting? And what is your adab? Nothing, no. This, this is the fight of shaitan. It's not the fight of Allah jalla wa'ala that you're, that you're fighting. So now to come back. So we had the khawarij, we had the murji'ah that said, and this hadith of la ilaha illallah is a proof that when you say la ilaha illallah, it saves you from hell. Because the scholars, they differ. We're still talking about iman and the essence of faith and iman. Like actions, are actions a part of iman? Yes. But are they the core of iman? No, not according to Ahlul Sunnah. So that man that came to the Prophet and said, and he, he, Ali Sallallahu said, la ilaha illallah. And then he said, ya Rasulullah, Yani, what if I were to be killed now? He said, you will enter Jannah. Now, and then he threw away some dates that he had in his hand. And he said, life is too long to eat all of these dates. If my destination is Jannah, I have to wait eating these dates. I mean, I can be in Jannah much quicker than this. So he threw the dates away. And now people say, Astaghfirullah, the Sahaba, they, they, were, they were what? They were not respecting food. Is that is it really that way you take away from the Hadith? You're in war. You're, you're engaged in war. Put the dates here. There is nobody about to fight me. I mean, that's like, Ya Rasulullah, if, I, if I'm killed now, what happens? Okay, he throws them away. He doesn't think about it. And he was killed. And then the Prophet said, Dakhala al-Jannata wa lam yasjud lillahi sajda. He entered paradise and didn't perform one sujood for Allah. So we say, if sujood, salah, or whatever it were, was the a prerequisite and a condition for the validity of your faith when you utter it, then many people will not be Muslim because you do the shahada, you may die. My father died after the shahada, he never prayed. He was in his deathbed, right? On his deathbed. He said the shahada when I was 23, and then he went into a coma and never, was never able to pray. So, alhamdulillah. But does that mean that you can take that risk of not committing deeds? Of course not. Because not praying according to many scholars is kufr. According to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Ahdu alladhi baynana wa baynahum salat man tarakaha faqad kafar. Yani the difference between us and them is prayer. And the one who does not pray has committed disbelief. And the Prophet and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum can la yarawna shay'an kufra siwa tark as-salah. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum would not consider anything to be kufr apart from not praying. So at least you do what you have to do in order to save your skin from hell. Because even if it were, were only to be temporarily, it's too long. Now every second in hell is a second, a second too many. So now you see why Iman became so difficult because then we had the Iman bil qadai wal qadar. Iman bil qadai wal qadar in predestination. You had the qadariya and you had the jabariya. The sex all in the first hundred years of Islam. Imagine. Imagine what for a chaos it was and how difficult it was for the scholars to keep on representing faith like it was in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. But what you understand now is that it was no longer possible to pass on the aqidah in at a very basic level. Because now you have all these people philosophizing. Well, we had to philosophize now as well. And then you had people like Al-Harith Muhasibi who started refuting people based on philosophy, religious philosophy, to refute the bid'ah. And that's why Imam Ahmed didn't like him too much. Because Imam Ahmed wanted to stick to the books of the Sunnah, which is a good thing. But the problem is now exactly like today. Today it is science attacking the belief of people. Back then it was bid'ah. And I'm not saying science is bad, right? But today people are in conflict with themselves because of science. The problem is that science changes all the time. Many things now science doesn't know. So now we don't believe in it because science doesn't tell us about it. But in 50 years all of a sudden we believe in it. An, old, an entire new reality. 
hundred years ago they said the tiniest thing is this and then they say no 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 the tiniest thing is that so I'm not saying science is bad, but today people are in conflict with themselves because of one, science, and two, because of norms and values that are being pushed through the throat of people, especially when it comes down to gender, when it comes down to freedom of speech, when it comes down to role of men and women, whatever it may be. We are confused. So back then, people were confused in relation to the aqidah. So now just saying, no, you just have to do this or that was not enough anymore. So we had these um, intellectual warriors writing. And that's the biggest, I'm going to work, use the word jihad. Jihad in the Arabic language has more, more than 70 meanings. So don't misquote me, please. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَجَاهِدُهُ بِهِ جِهَادٌ كَبِيرًا Yani and battle them with it, the Quran. The biggest jihad, that's what it means. It means at an intellectual level. Debating, discussing, refuting. That's the biggest thing. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said in the Sunan, he said, The biggest form of jihad is speaking the truth in the presence of a tyrant. No? So now to come back. So then we have the Qadariyah. The Prophet ﷺ said, Al Qadariyatu Majusu Hadihi Al Ummah. The Qadariya, they are the animists of this Ummah. Ida Maridu, Nam Falat Al Ummah. When they become sick, do not visit them. When they are buried, do not attend their burial. That was in his time, alayhi sallam, that he said this, but they only appeared afterwards. So you had the Qadariya, they said there is no Qadar. There is no predestination. Allah created earth. And the skies and the universe, he sent the prophets, told us in the book what to do, but he doesn't interfere ever. And nothing is connected to his will, apart from the sun rising and setting and all these other things. They even started talking about the bada'a. Now, bada'a is uh, uh, that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when something happens, he can say, oh, I didn't like this, let me change it. And that's one of the aqaid of the Shia as well. So, and, and, and the Zaydiyah speak about this also in their books. So now to cut a long story short, you had the Qadariya, they say no Qadr. You had the Jabariya, they said we are robots. Of course they didn't say robots because that didn't exist, right? They said we are fully controlled. So this was a problem. Because people now when they start saying I'm fully controlled, they start blaming Allah for everything. And people that said there is no Qadr, they believe that Allah had nothing to do with their success, nothing with their downfall. So the people were disconnected and would yani, end up in a, in a yani, lack of faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you had those ones as well, all of them talking. Then you had the Shia. Now, the Shia, they were the ones at the very beginning. They were the ones that stood up for Ali radiallahu anhu. That then the word Shia had a different meaning. And that's why Imam Shafi, rahimahullah wa jal, in his collection of poetry, he said, if loving Ahl al-Bayt, yani the family of the Prophet ﷺ, is being a Shi'i, then I'm the first one to be a Shi'i. So the meaning of Shi'i back then was different until they became the Rafidah. So now to come back, what did we have? We had two camps. The camp of Ali radiallahu anhu and the camp of Muawiyah. Muawiyah didn't want to submit to Ali. That's just what happened, right? So we can say what we want, but that's what happened. He, everybody had to give yani the bay'ah to Ali, and Muawiyah, he said, no, I'm not going to do this. I will, ya Ali, I will be the leader of Sham, you are the leader of Najd. But the, bid, the bay'ah was given, there can't be two leaders. Now, you can be a sub-leader, but not two leaders. So, he didn't want to submit. But this ended up now in two political parties. The Ali, the, uh, the Alawiyin, the Adis, and the Muawiyin. Or, they would call them differently. So now you had these two people. People standing up for Ali and people standing up for Muawiyah. Now this was in a time where people were investigating also Hadith. So now people started declaring each other Da'if based on their, I'm going to say political, but in reality Ali was on the Haq. That's what I was going to say. Ali was on the Haq without any doubt. Now Muawiyah was a Sahabi radiallahu anhu. But Ali was on the Haq. So now when time went on, the people that were the Umawiyin, that were 
from the party of Muawiyah started attacking everybody who was from the family of the Prophet ﷺ. Not Muawiyah, but the son of Muawiyah. So now they started also declaring da'if, weak, all of the narrators that loved Ali. So when you look in the books of narrators, then you see, huwa da'ifun muttahan bil kathib li'annahu kana yahrisu Ali. You can't trust him because he is somebody that would protect Ali. So in that time, Habibi, I just want you to, to wake up. In that time, people would literally not accept a narration from somebody whose name was Ali. And others would not accept a narration of somebody whose name was Muawiyah. And based on that, some of the muhaddithun would say this. Someone whose name Ali doesn't come in here because he is siding with somebody. So that was a very different period in time. Muhammad ibn Sirin, he says, anhu, whenever I say, Qala Rasulullah, even though, والسلام, even though he didn't see the message of Allah, والسلام, he says that it is a narration that I narrate through Ali. But I cannot mention his name because we live in a time where the one who mentions his name is killed. People would be whipped for loving Ali. And that's why when the fifth Khalifa, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz came, who was from the Umayyin, he stopped the Sunnah practice of the Umayyin of cursing Ali on the minbar. If you wanted to be a khatib on the minbar, you had to curse Ali. <laughs> Radiallahu anhu. Now, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz stopped that. So no wonder that he got killed two years and a half after being a leader. <laughs> Although that adab was spread around the earth. So now you have, you have hadith. People declaring each other bid'ah, muqtadir. You had the, now the, the people that were standing up for the family of the Prophet they were right. Abu Hanifa rahimahullah azawajal, when the grandson of the Prophet wanted to, wanted to fight, he said, I have too many amanat that people gave me. People would give the, the Imam Abu Hanifa his gold, their gold, their silver, their money, their contracts. It will be all in his house because they wouldn't find anybody more trustworthy in Kufa than, Ali, than uh, Abu Hanifa. And he said yani, that if it were not for this amanat, I would have come to you and I would have fight, fought next to you, besides you. And when the people gathered, they all ran away when they saw the, 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 the army of the Umayyin. The only ones that remained were the Hadith scholars and the Fiqh scholars. And they fought. And they got killed. So many of them. So now you have this. Now what happens, and I'm so sorry, but you need to know this, right? Because people say, yeah, when Muslims rule, it was always perfect. <laughs> well, it was not. It really was not. Just when you look at Andalusia, for example, how they used to kill each other. Nephews, sons, uncles, all of them fighting. All the time. That's why Ibn Khaldun says the Arabs were too busy fighting while the non-Arabs were busy seeking knowledge. <laughs> That's what he says, Ibn Khaldun, is in his Muqaddimah. He says, don't you look at the Muhaddithin, the majority of them are non-Arabs. Bukhari is not an Arab. Muslim is not an Arab. That Abu Dawood is Sijistani. <laughs> no. So when you, when you look at Ibn Majah, it's not an Arab. Adarim is not an Arab. So when you look at them, you say, Nasai, it's not an Arab. So when you look at them, you say, SubhanAllah, the, the, the founder of the Arabic language, Sibawe, was not an Arab. So, so not meaning that there were no Arab scholars, of course they were, much more than the non-Arabs. Non -Arab. But they were all busy fighting, fighting. So now you had, on the one hand, the people that stood up for the family of the Prophet Sallallahu And because, especially when they saw the grandsons of the Prophet Sallallahu being killed, and then they were, their heads were put on spears, pointing toward Sham, 19 spears. Now I mean the great granddaughter of the Prophet Sallallahu She was shown the head of her father on, yani, on a tray. She said, where's my father? Where's my father? They're, all this is now books, books of Allah. She said, here's your father. And she died out of shock. She was two years old. So this was what, ha what was happening. So now the problem was, one extreme always leads to the other. And it's very difficult to stay in the middle. So these people that were first Shi'i, 
they now started hating all the Sahaba that were connected to the Umayyad. So they started saying, that Sahabi is kafir, that Sahabi. So they went to the extremes and left al sunnah Some of them remained, but a lot of them rafadu. Now they didn't want to accept yani the, the, what the new bay'ah, and they pushed it away. So now they went to the other extreme. Instead of defending the family of the Prophet they started attributing divine traits to the family of the Prophet Until they go, they go as far as to say when the Prophet was ascended with and Allah stretched out his hand, it was, it was the hand of Ali. Come on. And then when Ali heard that some people were venerating him, he burned them with fire. And then they said, why they were burning? Now we are even surer that you are God. Because none but God punishes with fire. So they, they, they were out of their minds. But can you imagine everything that, that happened? We inherited. And until today, and I, I can't talk about that in detail now, it affects the way that we understand things. It, it has an effect on the different sects that exist today. The different groups, the different shapes, the different everything. And it's so difficult in the midst of all of this to find that simple, beautiful, accessible, all-encompassing path to Allah Jalla wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why revisiting Iman, why revisiting the true essence of Iman and Islam and Islam, are of a major importance in your and my life. So, in very brief, the, the, they say, "Inna al-'alima bi'ilmihi yahzanu wa inna al-jahila ala bisat al-jahli yarqusu." The alim weeps because of the knowledge he has, while the ignorant dances on the carpet of ignorance because he's happy. Happy because he doesn't know. Happy because he doesn't know. So that's why and we are going to read some Aqeedah bi'idhnillahi azawajal. So now you know that Iman according to Ahl-Sunnah is qawlun wa amal. And this is in short. Or it is i'tiqadun bil qalbi qawlun bil lisan wa amalun bil abdan. It is in our words with the tongue, conviction with the heart, and deeds with the body. That's Iman. But the deeds are not the core of Iman. They are a proof that you have Iman. But we do not say to somebody who doesn't have a deed, but they say even saying La ilaha illallah is a deed, right? It's a deed of the tongue. So you have to utter your faith at least once, they say, and then never say anything that negates it. So if you say once La ilaha illallah Muhammad, Muhammad Rasulullah from your heart, you never repeat it again, but you don't do anything that negates it, or don't say anything that negates it, then your iman is intact the moment you die. But you don't want to be that person. So, before we carry on, what goes through your mind when you hear these things? Does it make you happier? Or sadder? Or worried? Or, or not anything of what I've just said? No, what, what goes through your mind when you see this? He said, "It's it's the reality of our of our history." Hey, what? I'm sorry. I don't know how to how to uh, shut this down. It's my my son contact contacting me on WhatsApp. So uh, anyway, I'm sorry if it keeps on making that sound. Yes. What goes through your mind? Yes. 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 You know, and, and that you, you, you have to try to first do it on your own. 
change you. Don't wait for that perfect thing to happen. Make yourself as perfect as you can, your family as perfect as you can, your environment, your neighbors. You know, and, and you try to start there. And if everybody does this, then we will live Islam without having somebody to tell us what to do. We, we, you know, the thing is, we can perfectly live Islam now. Of course, the hudud, yani the laws that, uh, and so forth, that, that's different. But we don't even practice the law in our own selves. In the way we speak, the way we react, the way we act. So that's one. And, and when you look at the Abbasiyin, it was terrible. I, if, if you look in the books of Tariq, and it, when that was happening, it was terrible. Uh, SubhanAllah, some of the things you don't even want to mention. I'm not going to mention them. Yes, somebody else. Yes, sir. Thank you. Who? Who? Imam Ali. Uh -huh. But uh, Imam uh, Ali didn't give up on his power. Not in that way. No, no. Not in the way you understand. No, that's okay. Yeah. Yes, somebody else? Somebody else? Yes. So as for the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, yani they are, they, they were praised by Allah jalla wa So it, it is really the followers or the people that lived among the Sahaba radiallahu anhu who created that fitna. So the Sahaba, of course, they were not creators of fitna. Allah subhanahu wa taala in many, yani subhanallah, many verses He praises the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. So, but that doesn't mean that they are infallible. Um, doesn't mean they're infallible. We don't believe they are infallible, but they, even with their mistakes, eventual mistakes, they are still better than we are. Like even the Sahabiya that was given the death penalty by the Prophet ﷺ because of adultery, she's better than us. Um, because they're Siddiq. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yani, makes it clear. فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْلَهُ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَظِرُ وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَبَدِيلًا يعني الأولون من المهاجرين والأنصار يعني the first of the muhajirin and ansar and those who follow them والذين تبعوهم يعني the ones that follow the muhajirin and ansar so we look up to them so they were not the reason for the fitna it were the people that were on their side and pretended to love them that created these fitnas so anyway, so you will see as we carry on, what I'm going to do, I'm going to explain to you as we speak about Asma wa Sifat, what is said about it, what the majority of the people said, how they approached it, why they differ. And, and it will become clear to you. And I'm not going to speak on behalf of anybody. I just want to share with you what's out there. Inshallah, Tabarakul Ta'ala. So I think until here, um, What time is uh, Aisha? Cool uh, past uh, nine. Uh, yes. Yes, of course. Yes. You know, in reality, the only ones who investigate that are the Qudah, are the Qadis, Qudah. Yani when they want to do Qada, they have to know. As for us, we, we are not concerned with what people are because it's of no added value to us. Unless you want to study with somebody and you want to know for yourself. Um, like, okay, the person in question, what did he study? What, what is his belief? Well, and so forth. 
But apart from that, we, we don't. We don't look into somebody's iman or somebody's kufr. Like, oh, is that person a kafir now? Why would you care? Unless he's married to your daughter, for example. Now then, then, then their marriage depends on the man still being a kafir or uh, still being Muslim or kafir. So the qadi in reality is the one who looks into it. But now we, we have all become judges. Now, so I'm sharing this so that you know what exists, not so that you would use it. And that you would take a microscope and say, okay, to tell a bit more about iman, about qadr. Well, this is not what I want you to do. I just want you to know what exists. And so that as an introduction to what we are going to talk about. And it, it will be very interesting. I'm, I'm sure it will be very interesting. When we talk about the names and the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I think we, we will see a lot of things, inshallah. So no, we don't, we don't. And is it difficult? Yes, it's difficult. Like everything is difficult. Because you need to study in order to know it and you don't have to know this. No. So I'm not sharing it at a level where it becomes really del diving into the, ma the, the matter. It's just like randomly talking about it. But there are like hundreds of books that, discu that discuss this topic. Yes. 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 Mm. Yes. Yes. Alhamdulillah, Ahlu Sunnah is very easy going. All the people that I've mentioned, we still believe they're Muslims. Uh, apart maybe from yani the, the, the Ghulat min the Shia, yani the Ghulat, the extreme Shias, because even they are divided into the different categories. That's why Ibn Taymiyyah said their leaders are Kufar, but their followers, they have a different ruling. Yani you can't know until you talk to them. So, um, Imam al Tahawi, in Aqid al Tahawiya, he says in Ahlu Sunnah, they believe that, that they can pray behind everybody from Ahl al Qibla. Yani meaning everybody that directs themselves to the Qibla and has Iman, we pray behind them. Unless it are, for example, people that are clearly outside of the deen. Like, for example, according to Ahl al Sunnah, the Qadiyaniyah would not be within the realm, so you would not be allowed to pray behind them according to the scholars. The Dahmaniya, for example. No. Yes. Mm. But even, even the ones that do that, uh, if you're referring to the more strict Salafi groups, they are, many of the youngsters, they are not following the advice of their mashaykh. So a lot of the Salafi mashaykh would not say such a thing. For example, don't pray, for example, be behind a Hanafi, don't pray behind an Ash'ari, whatever, because according to them, they would still be Muslims. So a lot of these youngsters that don't pray behind certain people, it's, it's very often because of their own understanding, but not of what their mashaykh are saying. Uh -huh. I don't know the reasons why. The people, yes, people will be doing this. People will be doing this, but we don't. We pray behind every Muslim. If he's a, uh, uh, from the Khariji, wherever they may be, I don't know, or he he is a, a Mu'tazili, whatever, we pray behind them because they're still Muslims. Yes. Okay, good question. Yes. <laughs> yes. No. Yes. That's a very good question. So, our ulama, they have spoken about this. Uh, there is a book in four volumes. It's, it's, it's about Isqatul Hudud. Yani, that which annuls the, the, the corporal penalties or, and so forth. And there are four volumes talking about what the reasons are not to punish somebody. So in Islam, the goal is not to punish. 
And that's why even when these people came to the Prophet ﷺ, so this man in another way, also a woman, and she said, and he said, I have fornicated, the Prophet ﷺ said, don't talk to me, uh, not like that. But he looked away. The man came from the other side and he said, I have fornicated. He turned away again. The man said it again. He said, maybe the man is not sane. Take him away. They said, he is sane, Ya Rasulullah. Then he said, maybe he has drunk of alcohol. So the man could have gone away every time. No? And the Prophet ﷺ was like literally pushing him away. He was not saying like, okay, let, let's do it right now. That, that was not so much. It's even that the capital punishment, like if you have fornicated, the, the goal is not that you go to the Qadi and you say that you have done it. That's not the goal. And, and so even if somebody were to say to the Qadi, I have fornicated, and then the, then the Qadi says, okay, pun, pun, the punishment will be given, there were no witnesses. Even on your way to get the punishment, you say, oh, actually I didn't. The Qadi says, go. You know that the death penalty was almost not given in the, can you, throughout the thousand years that Islam has ruled? It was like not something that, that it's an Amr Ijtihadi where the Qadi can still do Ijtihad. The rule exists, but doesn't mean it's the only punishment that, that the Qadi can give. That's what people forget, forget. So they see this is the punishment. It's a punishment that exists and can be given, but it's not always given. So now to continue, like the, 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 what the scholars say, if, you have, if somebody has fornicated, then the goal is not to go. The goal is to do Tawbah. It is when you are caught with four witnesses. And how does that even work? Four witnesses. What were you doing there? Like, do you understand? Like, like four witnesses. Like, now the four witnesses, when they, when, when, when there's no consistency between their testimonies, like one said it was a white blanket and the other one said it was a green one, it's annulled. And they get whiplashed. No inconsistencies. Plus, and I'm sorry to say this, but this is the fiqh that we find in our books. And they all have to confirm that they saw penetration happening. Otherwise, even if the couple would be, I'm sorry, together, and they would lay, one would lay on the other, that would still not be zina. So how is that even possible? It, it's like saying like, the requirements that have to be fulfilled in order to confirm zina is like almost impossible because sparing a life is so important so and then people go yeah islam is all about this and that you make one mistake one mistake and god come and like that that inspires you with awe and fear you're going to be very careful to say something so four people almost impossible then everybody has to see it happening really happening that's definitely impossible and then no, no inconsistencies so what do the scholars say? You do tawbah and tawbah and tawbah and tawbah until you feel that you have cried your heart out. They say tawbatun. Now tawbatun. Bighayri dam'atin. Now, they said be tawbah. Tawbah without a tear is no tawbah. Now tawbah is literally crying your heart out. So when somebody feels that he or she has fornicated, may Allah protect us against us, Ya Rabbi Ameen, then there is tawbah and also the second thing the tawbah is not just saying sorry it is closing all the doors that can lead to zina then you have to be like very harsh upon yourself like you know that when you watch a movie there will be nudity you know that we all uh, how do you call that zapper or whatever we do like we know oh now it's going to happen let's let's fast forward why do you want that in your house you know that people are going to use f words and other words in the movie you know it's going to happen. But it's okay. Oh, sorry, my son. Sorry, my daughter. These are bad words. Don't say them. Okay, dad. I mean, how does it even work? So now you, you have to stay away from every... Somebody has to stay away from everything that could lead to zina or has to do with it. Otherwise, the tawbah is not sincere. وَلَا يَتَّقَرَبُ زِنَا do not come near to zina. Navratun fakalamun fa A look, a talk, a what? A meeting. That's the way it works. So low, the person should lower the gaze and, and stay away from everything that even looks from 50,000 kilometers away like zina. Not talk about it, nothing. Stay away from it.
And then, bi Allah rahmah of Allah Jalla wa'ala is very big, far bigger than our hearts and our own understanding of rahmah. So this is in brief where I want to stop. I will be leaving now, inshallah, wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and give you the best of the both worlds. And inshallah, we see each other next week. For those who want, uh, you will see with uh, Khayyam as well. Um, we have uh, tomorrow at 9 o'clock, I give tafsir. That's also online. Uh, so I've been doing that for how many years now? Yeah. Four years? Yeah. So, and we are doing just tabaraka now. So you can also follow that. It's, it's very interesting, I think. It's in the light of Tafsir al-Razi. Tafsir al-Razi is, it was my dissertation for my PhD. So it's something that I feel quite comfortable at delivering. Inshallah tabaraka ta'ala. So if you want to join, then you can do that. Inshallah. Wa usalli wa usallim. على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين. بسم الله. And I I I will not be able to answer any questions because I have to leave immediately إن شاء الله. الله يبارك. جزاكم